Hello. I'm uh, I'm sorry I can't be there with you tonight. Um, but uh, if there's one thing you take away from this evening, I'd rather it wasn't uh, COVID. <laughs> I think I managed to catch COVID last time I was uh, due to speak at Live and Free. So at least I'm con consistent. Um, so if the, you see lots of cuts during the video, it's either because I've had a coughing spree or because I've said something I've not meant and I'm hiding the evidence. Um, and my notes, I've got my notes here, so if I'm looking down, that's because I'm, I'm reading. So, last month, I uh, spoke to us about the topic of the land mourns, looking at how our sinful actions have uh, disastrous consequences on the environment and how this is almost seen most in climate change at the moment and how the leaders of our countries uh, seem to be doing little about it. Tonight we're looking at the land rejoices, mm, maybe a little bit more positive. <laughs> we're looking at redemption and the hope in God's plan for creation. Now, I wonder if you've ever uh, had a spiritual experience in nature. Has God ever met with you in creation? Has he ever spoken to you? Have you ever learned something or seen something demonstrated through creation that has brought you closer to God? Uh, I had hoped to run around with a microphone here and uh, hear some of your stories. Uh, but unfortunately, you're just going to have to listen to my thoughts on this. Uh, I can't think of a time when God has spoken to me through uh, creation, but I do often find myself in awe of things I've seen, the beauty present in nature. And I find that does lead me back to wonder in God. If you haven't experienced God in nature, that's fine. There's been some really interesting studies that have produced a theory called spiritual pathways that puts forward that there are seven main ways to meet with God. These are relational, through relationships with people, intellectual, through the study of Bible and other texts, worship, through music, prayer and liturgy, activist, through standing up for what is right and speaking out for the vulnerable, Contemplative, through quiet prayer and pondering. Serving, meeting the needs of people around you and nature. It is common to find that you meet with God through a couple of these uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, if you're not sure which way you meet with God, there is actually a questionnaire you can do. If you Google spiritual pathways, or I'll put a link to the in the description of the video so you can follow that and have a look. At Alive and Free, we probably mostly provide for people the worship spiritual pathway through the music or the intellectual spiritual pathway through the talks. But hopefully we may have provided a little bit for those with the nature spiritual pathway through this series of talks. Uh, these are just about how we meet with God. It's not necessarily even where your skills are, and it's not an excuse for you to get out of doing one of them. It's not about saying, I don't meet with God in an intellectual way, so I don't have to read the Bible, or I don't meet through God through servitude, so I don't have to sit with people. It's not like that. It's about knowing where you meet God and making sure you spend enough time in that area meeting with him. Make sure you don't neglect that area. It's a really good reminder that God didn't use a cookie cutter when creating us. We all find different ways of meeting with him. We all have different ways of worshipping him. We're all equipped with different gifts so we can all serve him in different ways. The body of Christ is an image used all through the New Testament with lots of different parts, with different functions, all working together as a single body to do God's work. It is in diversity and the unity of the, that diversity 
that we the church have strength. It's also interesting that not just the church fits this description, but so does creation itself. The diversity found in creation is really mind boggling to think about. There are over, a, over a million different species of insects, approximately 7,000 new species are discovered each year. And scientists reckon there's another 10 million species yet to be discovered. That's just one example. If those numbers aren't crazy enough for you, we could look up to the sky with 100 to 400 billion stars in our galaxy alone, yet none have the exact same properties. And yet creation also displays a unity. Everything is create connected and the effects of something cannot truly be seen by your, our own eyes. Perhaps the unity of creation should not surprise us as the creator himself is a perfect unity. When I think on this uh, and how everything's connected, I just get lost in wonder, which is probably why the talk took me far too long to write as I did a whole lot of wondering and not a whole lot of writing. So as I said, tonight's topic is the land rejoices. So I wanted to take a second to think about what that means. As I was doing my research, I came across a passage from Psalm 96. So I'm going to read that now. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. When I was thinking about how creation worships, I was struck by the image of a tree waving its branches in the wind. The wind being a common biblical image for Holy Spirit. Then I also realised that many people in worship do the same thing and put their arms in the air in a very similar matter. Just struck me as interesting. And it might seem that I am anthropomorphizing creation here, giving it human characteristics to worship. But I would still argue that doing exactly what you were created to do is the best way to worship your creator. I could keep talking on how creation itself worships, but the words I have do not really do justice to the works of our creator's hand. So I'm going to show a video um, and I want you to take a minute to reflect on the worship of creation. For God so loved creation that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into creation to condemn it, but to save creation through him. That's probably the most famous uh, Bible verse. Um, the Greek word that's commonly translated into world is cosmos, which is where our word cosmos comes from. It can mean world, but it usually means world in entirety, or maybe even universe. So does translating it as creation or universe make us think more broadly about God's salvation plan, about why Jesus was sent into the world? We often think of God's salvation plan as purely to save us, to redeem us and bring us back to himself, which is of course correct. This was part of God's salvation plan, but was the plan broader to bring the whole of creation back to himself? The idea of the new creation is something that runs through both the Old and New Testaments, and that's the idea of the time when the whole of creation will be renewed and redeemed, and heaven and earth will no longer be separate. separate. I want to read a quick brief passage from Romans 8. 
For creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation will be liberated from its bondage and decay and brought to freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. So in Paul's writings, he writes that the whole of creation is looking forward to this time of renewal, and that the world we're seeing now is a world in birth pains, that's waiting for this new creation to be birthed out into the world. I'm going to read the passage, the series book, uh, the book we've been using for the last few months, recommends for tonight's topic. It's Isaiah 35 uh, verses 1 to 7. And the book asks how you choose to interpret this passage. Um, it's a prophetic vision from Isaiah. Um, so it asks whether you choose to interpret it as metaphor with images of spiritual renewal or whether in light of God's salvation plan for all creation you interpret it as a, a literal um, vision of the future or maybe it's a bit of both. I'll let you decide as I read it. I'm going to leave you on this passage now. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendour of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendour of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear, your God will come, and he will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be open, the ears of the deaf unstopped. The lame will leap like deer, the mute tongue will shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs, in the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for creation. We thank you for the world that we live in. We are in awe of the wonder and the beauty. Lord, we look forward to the time when it is renewed and we live in the new creation. We wait eagerly on that time. Lord, please help us to take care of creation now and help us to look forward to the new creation to come. Amen.